Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for helping us wake up healthy. We're grateful for all the blessings and necessary things that you give us daily. And I hope you have a good confirmation class. And yeah, amen. Amen. I'd like to see you guys on camera. I think we've had some goofing off. So I'd like to see you guys on camera. Um, also, um, that may not be true next time we meet. I will let you know. If I'm up at Camp Aloma and it's using up too much bandwidth, then you might get out of being on camera. But I'm thinking I'll probably be back here for um, on the 3rd. Um, I'm not sure there's still, I think sometime today they were going to decide for sure if they're doing a retreat out there. Have you guys heard anything? I think they said on the 20th they'd decide. I don't know for sure what they're doing, but we're overdue. I had some leave from work and I'm trying to do germ-free travel, so we're going to go up there. But if we're up there, we might not get too close to anybody, all right? I'm, I'm trying to take care of the veterans. I'm also trying to take care of church people. I don't want to drag germs from work into church people, so I'm trying to be cautious. All right. Are we um, taping yet? Or we are. We're on tape, so. We had a little Christmas party for youth group yesterday. Can't do it. real exciting stuff online, but thank you to those of you who were able to come for being there. And we'll try and keep on keeping on. Um, hopefully when we start being able to meet live, we'll have exciting times. I'm probably going to try getting that, um, that vaccination through work. If I don't grow a third eye or, or horns or have an arm drop off, I'll know that, that it's safe enough, at least for me, right? They still don't know, even with the vaccine, if you can pass the illness on to others or not though it, it'll they're saying it'll keep you safe but they're trying to figure out if it'll keep you from passing germs so there's all of that going on all right so we are looking again at communion we went over the whole idea of sacraments last week if you had to miss um please look look up the session and we talked about, in general, sacraments. And sacraments, as we define them in the Lutheran Church, have three parts. Anybody remember what those three things are? This will be a thing that you have to hammer home in your head. Because as, as you do your memorizing for baptism and Lord's Supper, these will be the things that I'll ask you to know. You don't have to know the catechism part. Can you say the question again? What are the three things in the Lutheran Church that we say define or describe a sacrament. Um, was it commanded by God forgiveness of sins and physical elements? Exactly. And what did we say the physical elements are in communion? The Lord's Supper? Bread and wine. Bread and wine, absolutely. Pastor showed those of you who are going to take your first communion, the little wafers we use. There's a little cup of wine. There's also grape juice available. Um, my son generally opts for the grape juice, but um, there's it's a very small amount of wine, so um, it should be consider it should be safe. Um, although it's <coughs> illegal for you to drink until you're 21, there are special exceptions for Christian communion and things like Jewish Passover, where they pass a cup of wine also. And remember, last week we talked about how the very first communion grew out of a Passover dinner where they had multiple courses and there were times when uh, it became a, very much a, a ritual much more than the first one which was you know be ready to run at any time we're, we're getting away from Pharaoh have your your coat on your cloak on your sandals ready we're out of here as soon as we get the word from Pharaoh when he's tired of us we're, we're leaving it's, it grew into a more formalized dinner, which it is still today. And they pass the, the, the bread, the flat bread, the matzos, and the wine at certain particular times during the dinner. Sometime during that course of multiple bread and wine passings, Jesus took the bread and the wine and blessed them and instituted the Lord's Supper. So that's some of the stuff we covered last week. It's in your catechism. It's on the lecture. So... I hate the word lecture. That sounds so talking down to someone. It's on the tape. 
from the tape from last week. So we finished that. That was basically the first part of the Lord's Supper, and then Pastor had a chat with the with the first year, or the second year students. And so we're actually just getting around to the second part, which is the benefit of the sacrament of the altar, the benefit. And we are on the top of page 331. And I was going to ask Miss Jessica to start us out this week. I lo oh, okay. I thought I lost Vanessa for a minute. I haven't. And I'm still up there as Andrew Byers. Hmm. I think I'll change my name. Hmm. I will change. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. Read what's in the box. The For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. So I told you, you didn't have to memorize this part. It's not part of the memory work. But that's a lovely thought to keep in your memory. Um, typically, this is not something that, I mean, a lot of churches that are still requiring memory work require just about the same things we do. But this is still a lovely thought to keep in, in your memory, even though it's not directly from the Bible. Um, I'm going to ask you to read that last sentence of what's in the box. Read it again, if you would, Jessica. The last that last sentence that starts with four. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Mm -hmm. That's what our, our life, our eternal life, and our salvation lie, rely on, where there's forgiveness of sins. And that's the benefit of this. So a little further down the page, and again, this catechism has something in it, the last ones before it didn't, the central thought, so that you know what the main point is. Just like when you go to English class, ELA, they have you figure out the thesis statement of a paper or of each paragraph, right? That's what this does. It talks in that central thought about reading Exodus 12 and the Passover meal. We didn't read it word for word last week, but we talked about it. And underneath that, by the maroon cross, it says, As Christians, we confess that the forgiveness of sins won by the death of Jesus on the cross is now delivered to us in the body and blood of Christ. This is the most important gift we can receive. Well, well, what nice timing for those of you taking First Communion, because usually we do it on a day called All Saints Day, but we're doing it on Epiphany. When we celebrate the coming of the wise men, that's when we're doing it this year. For um, We're talking with Yosia. For Yosia, in her home country and in her father's family, where they were Eastern Orthodox, it's actually their Christmas day. So either way, it's a day of gift giving. But it says here, the most important gift we can receive is this body and blood of Christ. He came to us as that baby in the manger. He continues to give us his body and blood in, in communion. So a closer reading, question 362, what's the benefit promised? The forgiveness of sins which Christ won when he suffered in his body on the cross and shed his blood to redeem us is now promised in his body and blood given to us to eat and to drink. And um, Miss Faith, would you read verse number 1104, which comes from 1 Peter? Would you read verse, that's verse 1104. Will you read that for us? What page? It is on page 332. Eleven oh four, first Peter two twenty four. Okay. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die in sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have 
healed. Yep, and that idea by his wounds you have been healed, you find that in Isaiah chapter 52, which which was a prophecy that the Christ would suffer. It was given about 700 years before Jesus' birth. Um, by his stripes, you have, you, you have been healed by his wounds. So his death on the cross makes us, makes us alive and healthy, spiritually alive and spiritually healthy. He had to become unhealthy through his great physical suffering and emotional and spiritual suffering on the cross so that we could become healthy. And so that our bodies can live in heaven a new healthy life too. That's We don't always talk about the bodies being healed in this, but we won't see it in this lifetime. We'll see our bodies break down. Like I'm older than you guys, and a couple weeks ago I took a bad fall on my knees, and it took a while to heal up. I'm not as young as I used to be. We, look, we see our bodies break down, but we're going to have them back in eternity when, when Christ returns, all healed and perfect. Since we're there, Faith, would you do us the favor of reading verse 1105? We've heard these words a lot through our discussion on communion, but let's hear them again. What page? Page 332, right below where you are at. Oh. So, the next one there? Uh-huh. Oh, five. Uh-huh. Very good. We've been hearing those words a lot over and over again. So in this section below that says note, Pastor stepped out on us a for a minute, and I was just going to mention with him here, we were getting to his favorite book. He loves Leviticus, something a lot of people don't read. Takes a little bit of work to read Leviticus because most of it all is all about do this sacrifice and do it in this way. Um, but it talks about Leviticus 17, 10 to 14. Um, I, if any of you have your Bibles, you're welcome to find that there in Leviticus. Um, otherwise, I'm going to give you the gist of it. And again, that's why this catechism is a great thing. We, we are reading the Word of God, right? We believe in the Word of God, the Bible, but it's quoted for us here in our book. Leviticus chapter 10. And this was one of the books Moses wrote. And the Levites, that's why it's called Leviticus, the Levites were all the people, the tribe of, of Levi, um, which Moses and Aaron were from. They were the people who served in the temple, and then out of those, the descendants of Aaron became the priests, and they were told how to do sacrifices and, a certain, and to do it in a certain way. And it talks about... Um, God says to Israelites, any living, any Israelite or person living among them who eats blood, I will set my face against that person. I will be highly upset with them. I will turn my back to them. For the life of the creature is in its blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourself on the altar. No one of you may eat blood. And actually, way even before there was a Jewish nation, God told Noah that um, I can't prove it, but I kind of feel like maybe we should, and I'm not going to dump a big law on you, but I kind of wonder if we should all be eating kosher, because God gave that commandment to Noah before there was a Jewish nation, and then in the New Testament, when the the, church, the council met, called the Jerusalem Council of the Christian Church, um, it said don't eat blood sacrifice to idols, and part of that was the blood sacrifice, or uh, meat sacrifice to idols still had its blood in it. Um, they, they slit the throat. Kosher meat, they're supposed to slit the throat and drain the blood out, where some of the meat that we get, they may club the animal on the head. Yes, Miss Jessica? Um, God gave the commandment to Noah to eat what? Not to eat meat with its blood in it. Not to eat the blood of an animal. Okay. So the note here talks about God set, forbids it, but in the Lord's Supper, he gives us Jesus' blood to drink. This is another indication that that this is instituted by God as a sacrament. It, sh it demonstrates that in Christ's blood we're forgiven and share in his life. So back in Old Testament times, they sacrificed animals. It, it was like a foreshadowing. Who here in literature classes, ELA, has talked about foreshadowing in literature in a story? 
Do teachers ever bring up foreshadowing a little bit? Anybody able to explain what foreshadowing means in literature? Well, actually, it's, it's looking forward to the future, but good, good guess there. Um, yeah, it's like um, in literature, they'll, they'll may, they maybe have one theme of, of um, let's just say, for instance, an animal dies, and that foreshadows that one of the people in the story is going to die. Well, all the stuff in the Old Testament, it's like foreshadowing, only a little stronger than foreshadowing, because those sacrifices didn't count for nothing, all those animal sacrifices. But if Jesus weren't eventually going to come, they would have just been animal sacrifices. So they were a foreshadowing, but they were stronger and actually gave forgiveness of sins because they were tied into the eventual sacrifice of Christ on the cross. But you can think of it kind of like a foreshadowing. So they were told way back then, don't eat the blood. For one thing, the life of a creature is in its blood. It can only be used in sacrifices. They sprinkled the altar. Imagine, like, our church isn't that messy. We have pretty contained Lord's Supper, right? We don't even do big agape feasts like I discussed with you guys. Pretty orderly. You walk up, you get your, your, your wafer, your blood. We do things in a certain order. Back then, they played all kinds of instruments, and they shouted for joy on their way coming into temple, or tabernacle they came down the hills singing these psalms and playing harps and crashing cymbals and blowing trumpets and then when they got to temple the priests took the blood and once a year they went into the most sacred holy part where the ark of the covenant was and they threw blood all around can you imagine worship that looked like that and there were certain times when they sprinkled blood out on the crowd like, like we wear our nice dresses to church and be like, oh, I went to church today. I went to temple today and I got blood thrown on me. That's because Christ hadn't died on the cross yet. They needed the blood sacrifices. Now we no longer do. I saw the face that faith made. Yeah, we would not do that nowadays. We would not like that. We also don't need to do that now because Christ has come and died for our sins. So that line that I had Jessica repeat, letter B, where sin is forgiven, there is life with God and salvation everlasting. Um, the next Bible verse is a little bit longer. I was going to ask Miss Daisy to read it, verse 1109. Kind of ties in with what I was talking about, worship and coming into Jerusalem. Mount Zion is the, the hill that that Jerusalem sits on. So they come into this hilly city of Jerusalem coming from different directions and they'd meet up and they, or they'd actually climb the hill. There's, that's why some of the Psalms talk about a song of ascent. They were going up the hill into Jerusalem and they were different lines of people coming in from different parts of Israel and they were singing and playing their loud instruments. So this is a picture of that in the New Testament. Verse 1109 on page 332. I can't hear you. Are you reading? You must be muted. I can't hear you. Um, it shows that she reread. Shows what? Unmuted, but I can't hear her. I can't hear her either. Yeah, it shows yeah. it's unmuted, but we can't hear you. You'll see it. Um, I'm going to ask you to read verse 1109, and we'll give Daisy a bit of time to figure out what's going on with her sound there. Verse 1109. Okay. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 through 24. But you have to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, 
the judge of all, and to the spirit of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the medi mediator of a new co covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Yeah. Who's Abel again, besides your family friend named Abel? Um, Yosia has a family friend named Abel, the brother of... Huh, I could lip read Daisy enough to see that she was saying the brother, but we still can't hear you. Um, but who's Abel? Um, in the Bible? Uh-huh. Um, Adam and Eve's son. Mm-hmm. And he was murdered by Cain, so he was the first one to have his blood shed. Hey, do you have, Daisy, in your case, because I'm not showing you as muted, I'm just not showing you as anything, is it possible that your sound isn't connected now? Like that you're, you don't have um, your audio on? Connected, it was to connect you to audio, and then it would be like connect off. That's true. Let me see here. Looks like Mr. Miller is coming over to provide some assistance. So, yeah. So it talks about a festal gathering, a feast. So just like these people used to come in, the Old Testament people used to come into Jerusalem and and have a big, you know. Like I said, they had it. They had their worship was 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 um, a lot more what we could would call raucous than ours. They would come in to in from separate streams from different towns and meet up outside Jerusalem and climb the holy hill and crush the cymbals and play the harps and blow the trumpet yes, and sing the songs. Yes. So that's um, that's what was in that behind that verse in Hebrews, and so we come to a new um, a new festival every time we come to the Lord's Supper, where we can eat and drink. So your mic is on. Can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. She called me Mr. Miller. Thank you. I couldn't see your face, Faith. I thought it was I thought it was your dad coming to help. I'm sorry. Thank you, Faith. My apologies. I couldn't see a face and I assumed. So while you were gone, um we meant we read something from Leviticus and, and I told everyone it was your favorite book. We weren't even here to, to know that, but that's okay. Pastor's back, so now we have to behave ourselves. <laughs> it's all on tape anyway. Did you have a question, Jessica? Yes, um, can I just, may I her back? Yeah. Did you have a question, Yosia? Oh, I thought you raised your no. hand too. Okay. No. So, life and salvation. And so, part C, as Christ gives us victory over sin and Satan in this sacrament, he strengthens us for a new life in him and it brings up that verse from first peter 2 24 again that faith read for us earlier um but also the next verse below that one 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 two um so i'll ask daisy to read verse 1112 look how far we've gotten in verses and that's on page 333 1112 it's a you throw a short one at her now Yeah, page 333. It's 1st... 1,112. 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Yep. So again, the other part of going to the sacrament, it's, you know, we got baptism, we got the Word of God, we got the Lord's Supper to, to fight off the devil. 
So why should Christians be encouraged to receive the sacrament frequently? Now, when I was a kid, most Lutheran churches only had communion once a month. Then it became more typical to do it twice a month, and then some churches decide they want to do it weekly. Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches do do it weekly. They call it an unbloody sacrifice. Remember when I said they believe that it turns from the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, and they put it at a very high level? It becomes almost superstitious in some cases where where some Catholic people will take the blessed bread and wine out, and instead of eating it and drinking it, which makes it the sacrament, they take it out through fields that it's supposed to give some sort of blessing because it's blessed bread and wine. We don't do that. Way back, as people were in, in some of the Protestant churches were kind of wanting to create some distance between them themselves and Catholics, they took communion a lot less frequently. So it got to be like once, what they would say once a quarter, once every three months, four times a year they do communion. Some of them dwindled all the way down to once a year. Um, and they put a lot of the emphasis on preaching. Then, like I said, it, it moved back up to a more frequent rate of about once a month. Then twice a month. And then churches like Apostles are... Um, when we were pre-COVID times, we were doing it weekly. So why do you think we should be encouraged to take the Lord's Supper, the sacrament, frequently? It's, I think it's because it's the least we can do because we're like, oh, it's not like enough for us to celebrate him giving us this like chance to start over. So definitely it celebrates it. Christ invites us and urges us to come. Also, it's a meal, right? Now, it's not a meal you're going to fill up on physically, but how often do you eat? Three times a day. Three times a day. Sometimes some of I would say some of you work in some extra snacks. I, I got a teenage boy, and it seems like it's constant snacking, right? So, yeah, snacks. Um, we can't just eat once and call it good, right? Now, baptism is a one-time thing. Face it, definitely not. We eat. So, because Christ set this up as a meal, he set it up for us to eat frequently and so renew our covenant with him. Have you, and you, we might think of it like special dinners even, because we're talking about, you know, a special dinner where we renew a covenant. When we have dinners with family, friends, we renew old friendships, right? Now, now this is a special kind of thing because the primary thing is God is giving forgiveness to us. But we renew that fellowship with him and with each other. So if you went like, like if you have someone that you want to stay good friends with, a school friend, how often through the school year do you probably have some sort of meal with them? We're talking about when it's not COVID times. COVID times is messing all of us like every up. Every single day except for weekends? Every single yeah. day. You sit and have lunch with them at school, right? Yeah. So, yeah. To be part of the fellowship. Communion means fellowship. That's another word used for the Lord's Supper. We're in fellowship, first of all, with God, because Jesus is coming again to forgive us, but with each other. <coughs> So the verse listed there is from Jesus' words of institution. Take, eat, this is my body. Part B, the reason why we're encouraged to come so much, we need Christ, comfort, and strength. And the, again, the words of institution, this is the blood of my covenant, which faith read for us earlier, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And C, we're united with Christ and our fellow believers. And so, verse 1,115, are you there, um, Vanessa? Could you read verse 1,115 on page 333? Me? Yeah, Vanessa, can you read 1,115 on page 333? 
because I don't know where my commandment book is. Oh, that's okay. I'll ask Jessica to read it then. Jessica, would you read 1,115? Yeah. Uh, um, it says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, all You're freezing up on us a little bit. For we all partake of the one bread. So I told you how we did agape feasts when I was in college and they would literally have the loaf and they would break it. And that's how the first Lord's Supper at when Jesus, the night he was betrayed, did it. That's how it was through most New Testament times. They didn't have the individual wafers. Um, some um, Catholic churches still do this thing and some Lutheran churches will do it where they have one giant wafer they call it the host and they'll snap it so the other people getting communion may get the small wafers but there's one big one they snap and the idea besides this being Christ's body and blood there's other things now we said that part isn't symbolic that's a mystery but there are other aspects of this like the fellowship aspect that there's some symbolism built in and, and the idea that there's one bread many grains come into making one loaf for instance and so going back to you and your friends have you and your friends ever through grade school or junior high again pre-covid times have you ever done lunch swaps or you've got a really great sandwich and you break off half and give it to them face nodding your head or they give it to you because your mom made a sandwich you hate and they've got something great yeah so there's that idea of having something in common with the people we associate with, right? So it's that fellowship, that fellowship we have. So part D is Christ has given himself to us completely with his body and blood. The sacrament strengthens us in sacrificial love and service. So Miss Faith, would you read verse 1116 on page 334 what? 1116 on page 334 we're in we're in John the book of John again John 1512 So it takes the grace and forgiveness of God, his love for us, to be able to turn around and love each other, right? And even then, we do a messy job of it. Yes, Vanessa, do you have a question or a comment? I found the book already. Oh, good. In a little bit, then, we'll give you a chance to read. So from Luther's large catechism there, it said, under the note, it says, The sacrament is a pure, wholesome, and comforting remedy. What's a remedy? Have I heard the word remedy? What is it, Daisy? A remedy. It's like, isn't it like ways to fix something? <laughs> like there's like home remedies, but is it like a way to fix something? A cure. It's like medicine or treatment for something. Yep. By the way, Faith, I saw that hair pulling. And that time I knew it was you. <laughs> So it's a remedy that grants, pardon me? It's a remedy that grants salvation and comfort. It will cure you and give you life in soul and body. Where the soul has recovered, the body is also relieved. Remember I talked about that. Um, someday we're going to go to heaven and have our bodies, even if they've been destroyed or even if like Christ is returning um, before we die, our bodies will be restored. 
So by giving us spiritual health, ultimately it will give us eternal physical health because our bodies won't break down or be subject to injury or death. Even though it's not a, a Bible thing per se, I really encourage people to read um, the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia. It's really a neat read in this regard where um, Narnia is a great place to get away to from our world anyway, but there are still challenges and dangers because they fight great battles in their armor and face arrows and, and everything else. But then they go to new Narnia where things are even better than the old Narnia that was slipping away from them. Your sounds disappeared again, Daisy. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to have to get good at lip reading today. Every so often I catch a word by lip reading. I don't know what's going on there. So the power of the sacrament of the altar. We're on page 335. We're getting on to part three here. Now I've lost one of my readers, a very good reader, because until we figure out Daisy's sound. No, she was talking to me. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, I see the muted microphone, so it's all good. What turned out to be wrong with, with Daisy's sound before? She didn't have the right um, headphone audio. Yeah, like, on this stuff, if you go to, like, the mute, there's, like, this arrow thingy. And it says, like, um, microphone type, high definition audio device, microphone um, negative five, and then same as system. Okay. So part three on the sacrament of the altar, how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Top of page 335. So just a second, someone's at the door, so I may need to put a mask on. Do you want me to go set the alarm in the church? I oh, I guess not. Um, someone was in our building. Yeah, um, I shouldn't even be there for anything. I, uh, so part three, how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Can I get one of you to read that? Or Daisy, I asked Daisy to read it. Go ahead, Daisy. Okay. Um, um, okay, how can, how can bodily eating and drinking do such great things? Certainly not just eating and drinking to eat. That's the words written here. Give, given which I previously was to give I'm sorry, is these words at all? Sorry. I don't know, I can't breathe right now. This is bodily... Exactly. So it's not just the eating and drinking these that do these things, but the words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. The the central thought as Christians, that's on this page right here, the, the maroon cross, as Christians. We confess that the words of our Lord Jesus do just what they say. What Christ's lips speak and say, so it is. I remember when I wrote the word is in big capital letters, not represents, not might be, but is. Um, and we talked about how is is not a necessary word in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, and yet the word is there, plain as day in Greek. And so probably also when Jesus said it in Aramaic, this is my body. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so this has to do with the memory work. So after the first, second, and third article, there's the Lord's Prayer. We need to do that too, right? Yes, but that on that, you don't, and that should, will probably be easier for you, but I don't let people to jump ahead to that because then they don't want to come back and do the creed. Yeah. But you don't have to do all the explanation part on that. You just have to do the Lord's Prayer. And I bet most of you know that already. Yeah, I was just wondering um, because I accidentally clicked to the wrong page. I'm like, ooh, let's see what the issue is that I'm trying to do right now. Yep. And then after that, you just have to explain baptism, the Lord's Supper, and, and confession and absolution to me. And I'll tell you what you need to know for those things to be able to explain it. And then you have to do the 66 books of the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that's New Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 
First and Second Samuel, all of those. But you can break it into old and new, and there's some songs to do it by. If you want to sing it or rap it, that's okay. And so yeah, the big memorizing is it, you. People reach a thing when they get the creed done. It's kind of like, whew, I feel a little better now. And then and then after that, the books of the Bible is a bit long and drawn out, but still. That comes fairly easily to people once they get going on it. And there's there's songs out there to do it. So, yeah. This talks about Mark 4, 35 to 41. Um, again, when you, when you can go back through your catechisms. Um, but that's the story of Jesus calming a storm. His, and that's to show that the, his word means what he says it means. You guys remember from Sunday school the story of Jesus calming a storm? He was asleep on a boat with his disciples. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Out on the Sea of Galilee. Not the time where he walked on water, but a time he was asleep on the boat. And the disciples are freaking out, even though he's just done all these great miracles. They're on this boat crossing a lake. And even, it says, it's interesting in Mark. Mark has the most colorful language if you read it closely. And, and you see it even more clearly in Greek. It's always saying immediately, then next, in a hurry. That's Mark. Um, a lot of action in there. But anyway, it says the disciples were terrified. Instead of just being relieved about the storm being over, they were terrified. Like, ah, who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? freak out moment um and and the, we can approach the lord's supper that way or we can with the with the lessons of history say this is the lord who does what he says and and says what he means and does what he says and that's what he does in the lord's supper just like he did miracles through his word just like he was present at creation as the eternal word the second person of the trinity god spoke the eternal word and it said let it be and everything came in came into being so the word all right <clears throat> so moving on how can bodily eating and drinking give us such great benefits and it, it repeats again the words um, given and shed for you this is on the bottom of page 335 top of page 336 given and shed for you and it quotes something again from the large large catechism which is the big catechism that pastors have to read through usually um, lutheran school teachers learn about it and in there luther wrote in these words you have both truths that it is christ's body and blood and that it is yours as a treasure and gift so going through this we talked about this a while before does um everyone who eats and drinks a sacrament receive forgiveness of sin life and salvation no all who eat and drink receive christ's body and blood and are offered the benefits but it's only through faith in christ's words we receive the benefits it talks about in romans 7 um the righteousness of the righteous shall live by faith that's actually a quote from the book of Habakkuk and John 20, 29 about believing. But it also refers us back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Remember, 1 Corinthians chapters 10 and 11 talk about communion also. And it talks about being guilty of the Lord's body and blood if we take the sacrament in an unworthy way. So, yeah, we, we don't want to. And that's um, that's on verse eleven twenty. 20. Um, um well no actually um verse eleven twenty discusses something else but um it talks about receiving it with faith in um verses eleven twenty and eleven twenty one so yes miss jessica where is it where's the place where it says like the gift of the blood and the wine it's on the top of page three thirty six so question question 366, the answer to it, how should we eat and drink it um, with faith and confidence? So um, you'll see at, at the top of page 337, can I get you to read both verses 1120 and 1121? Yeah, what page? Page 337. 
And this is from 1 Corinthians 10 and 1 Corinthians 11, which are also chapters about the Lord's Supper. 3.37? Yes, ma'am. And what verse? Verses 11.20 and 11.21. Of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yep. Now, a little further up when it talked on question 365, when we're talking about not everyone receiving or not everyone get receiving forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. The verse they didn't print there that I wish they would have was 1 Corinthians 11.29, which is a little bit further down from what Yosea just now read in 11.26. And that's a verse that we talked about a few weeks or last week. Anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So there's a part that this is God's word and it is what it says it is so it's his body and blood regardless but if you receive it in an unworthy way there's problems because Paul goes on to say in verse 30 that's why so many of you are weak and sick a number of you have fallen asleep but if we judged ourselves we would not come under judgment when we are judged by the Lord we are being disciplined so we will not be condemned by the world so Paul says if you take this communion without being being worthy of it, without being in faith, without taking it for forgiveness of sins, you're bringing judgment on yourself. And that God needs to judge that way so that the, the world doesn't judge the church. And basically that's true of discipline anyway. Um, Paul says also in Romans that he leaves it to God to judge the world, but he judges the church. <clears throat> So, we're coming on to part four. We have about half an hour left. Everybody doing okay so far? All the talk about communion? Yeah. Okay. It's good preparation because, again, you know, we'll meet one more time before, um, before um, you all take your first communion. And we'll be talking about what's called the Office of the Keys um, and Confession. And confession is something we also encourage before you take communion. So, how to receive the sacrament worthily? Because remember, I just read of that big warning about not taking it in the right way. So, who receives the sacrament worthily? So, Jessica, will you read the box on the top of page 338? Okay, <clears throat> so the central thought, the essential way, what's, what's something that's essential? If someone tells you this is the essential thing about, about this story, or this is the essential ingredient in your cake that you're baking, what does essential mean? We usually think of it as the most important thing, right? The essential way to prepare for the Lord's Supper is to believe that Jesus' body, or to believe Jesus' promise that his body and blood are given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, did you have something you wanted to say, Jessica? I have something I want to say. Yes, ma'am. BT is spamming me in the chat that I'm being a bully. All right. Daisy. All right, Daisy. Yeah, Daisy. Go ahead, Jessica. Um, yes, I was going to say, like, what the central, central is, um, like, like the ones that are prepared and know what the, what the, what they eat at the 
Yeah, that means they know the essential thing. The, the people who know the essential thing, yeah. Because um, the ones that don't know are, um, worse, are worse things. I mean, like they're not worthy. They're not worthy, unworthy, yeah. So it says consider and read this word. Read yourself into this word, you, so that he may speak to you, he may not speak to you in vain. Again, that comes from the large catechism. So this is on page 338 under the central thought. What are some reasons people might think they shouldn't come to communion? Have you ever heard somebody say, I don't really think I should go? It doesn't happen too often, but what have you heard, Daisy? What have you heard some people say, like, I don't know if I should go to communion? Probably every Christian from time to time falls into that, but hopefully we don't stay stuck in that place. Technically, a person could be a Christian and not go to church, but the problem is you, you pro most people who do that, they quit reading their Bible, and when they do read their Bible, it becomes what we call a salad bar religion, like, oh, I like this verse, but I don't like that one too much, and so, yeah, we don't, we don't stay serious about it. Um, yeah. Once in a while, some people, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that some, um, people do not, um, people do not. Oh, you're breaking up on us. My best friend from childhood is Catholic. I think I may have mentioned that before. And when we all went to her Catholic church in Chicago, I said, go ahead. Not well prepared. Maybe they haven't been thinking about it. Some people don't go for that reason. I don't, I didn't, we didn't go to communion at my friend's Catholic church. Why do you think we didn't go there? Catholic churches pretty much only want Catholic people to go, and it's their belief about it turning into the body and blood of Christ, which we don't believe. Remember, we believe the bread and wine are still there in some mysterious way, and they believe Typically, Catholics have believed transubstantiation, where it turns into the body and blood of Christ. Although my Catholic friend tells me they talk a lot more now about real presence. Um, we don't typically go to communion. Um, I've never, I've visited Baptist churches and non-denominational churches only very rarely. And when I went, they weren't serving communion. But I wouldn't go to communion at their church because they believe it's strictly a symbolic meal. And I don't want to feed into that belief when that's not what I believe. On the other hand, there's people that visit Lutheran churches and, and they have a good, honest reason not to go. Um, people like in our church, pastor makes it a big point to explain what our communion beliefs are and to ask people to only come if they have the same beliefs and and. Baptist or non-denominational friends of our church members who come will either tell pastor personally or they'll they'll just say it afterwards um, I'm not going to communion or I didn't go because honestly I don't believe that stuff that you guys are saying about it the being the body and blood of Christ and I'm not comfortable with that so I'm not doing it <clears throat> so better that they do that than that they come and be part of something they don't believe in right that would be playing games with the sacrament. We don't want to play games with it. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm not going to communion because I feel like I've sinned too badly or I still have issues with someone else and so I don't think I should go to communion? Have you ever heard anybody yeah. say that? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think of that idea? Exactly. 
Exactly. So if you recognize that you're a sinner, you're still worthy to go. When you recognize, that's the paradox here. When you recognize you're unworthy, then you're worthy, right? So yeah, Jesus, it says here under the central thought, uh, since you said it so nicely on page 338, Daisy, would you read this by the maroon cross? It's under, it's part of the central thought, but just read the bold faced stuff by the maroon cross. It, there's not a number, but just here by the maroon cross on page 338, what's in boldface type there. It's boldface and italics, actually. Show me to the central thought of the fourth point of Jesus Christ I met with. And... You, um, just this part by the cross, but it's under the central thought. Oh, as Christians? That part? Yep. Go ahead and read the question underneath there. How can I prepare to endure and suffer so that I can receive a blessing? And above that, uh, before, uh, above where you were reading, it talks about reading Matthew 22, 1 to 14, and it's a parable about a banquet. Um, it's also recorded in Luke chapter 14, but one of, the, one of the tellings of this has a detail, the other doesn't. Um, so Jesus sends out servants. Do you remember this from Sunday school? He sends out servants to invite people to a banquet, and people have all kinds of excuses not to go to this banquet. Um, in fact, um, some of the people were so rotten that they seized this king's servants. It's a, it's a king who's holding this big wedding banquet for his son, they even kill the servants, and the king's very angry. Um, and then he says, go invite the, what we might call the lowlifes. Go invite the people that, um, that, that would normally not get invited to the king's banquet, the, the homeless people, the people living out on the streets, the people that are, are down and out. Um, and he invites them all. So in the, in the version in Matthew... Um, the king looks at these guests, and again, he's inviting the people that normally wouldn't be invited to a big banquet like this. It's the beauty of Christianity. He doesn't, God doesn't expect us to be cleaned up before he invites us. He invites us when we're messy. A lot of religions strive for, you know, having it together on the outside. The king came in to see the guests, and he saw a man who was not wearing the wedding clothes. Because back then, you were the the person who hosted the wedding feast would um, would provide robes, and especially for these messy people living out on the streets, like a homeless person coming to a wedding, and they're they're wearing their tattered up, torn up, nasty old, dirty clothes. And the king says, "Here, have a robe. If you're coming to my son's wedding, I want you to wear this robe." And one of the people that gets in there said, "Didn't wear the robe. Didn't wear the robe the king had given him." And so some translations say friend, but the translation is really fellow. The king sees his guest without the right wedding clothes and says, Fellow, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. So in addition to all those people who had blown the king off before and refused to come to the banquet, there's also this one particular guy in there who's not wearing the wedding clothes. And the king says, tie him up, throw him outside where people are weeping and gnashing, grinding their teeth because they're so miserable and unhappy because they're not in the banquet. And, and Jesus says, many are invited, but few are chosen. So what do you think it is about the robe? What is it? I'll get you in just a second, Jessica. What is the big deal with the robe? Why did he throw him out for not having a robe on? Well, they had gone out and invited the people in the streets. I think because he was underdressed, that's why he got kicked out. 
He was underdressed. There's pictures in the book of Revelation about us being clothed in robes of white or, or washing our robes in the blood of the lamb. Usually if you wash a white robe in blood, it turns it red, right? But this is a, a miraculous thing. It makes it whiter than snow. Not wearing the robe that God provides. The, the robe is his righteousness. I'm sorry, go ahead. So this is a parable with a king, and the, in, in, in the king is God in the parable. And the wedding banquet of the son is his son, Jesus, who is also God. But this person says, I'll show up and do it my way, right? That's what the problem is. I'll show up and do it my way. You invited me, so I just came in my clothes, and, and, and good enough, good enough, God. And so that shows the mistakes people can make. The first group of people who wouldn't come because it's like, I don't want to come to your banquet. I don't, I don't care. I don't want to do it your way. I'll do it my own way. And then this other man shows up who was invited from the messy, down-and-out street people. And he's still like, nah, I'll show up in my own clothes. You invited me, so I, I don't care about doing it your way. But the robe is a righteousness of God. And that's how we're worthy when we realize that of ourselves, we don't deserve to be at the banquet. And so this, the, the point of the parable, the symbolism of the parable is that we're dressed in, in God's righteousness, God's holiness. And we need to be dressed in God's holiness. Yes, Jessica, what was your question or comment? Um, where is the page you're reading about the Mary? It wasn't about Mary. It was about a. It was about a, a miracle or a, not a miracle, a wedding feast. Yeah, a marriage. A marriage. Oh, the marriage. That was that was um, not in the catechism itself, but it's in Matthew chapter twenty-two. And there's a little note here in your catechism about reading Matthew chapter twenty-two. It says to read that, and not everyone's showing up with their Bibles. So, Matthew yeah, chapter twenty-two. Whose dog is barking? Is that a miracle wedding? No, it's not a miracle. It's a parable of a wedding. So the person who receives the sacrament worthily, which is like what Daisy said earlier, is the person who, who knows that they're a sinner. And, who, and, and this says, when we have faith in his words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Top of page 339. Under question 367. So why should we be concerned about receiving the sacrament worthily? And uh, verse 1122, that's what I read to you a little while ago from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, verse 27, and this is 27 to 28. I read all the way through verse 30. You bring judgment on yourself if you're not worthy when you take it. If you either think... There's nothing to this. It's just a little wafer and some wine and it's no big deal. Or you say, I don't, I don't have to confess any sins because I never do anything wrong. Or any of those kinds of things. Then you're in danger of putting yourself in judgment. Um, question 369, when are we wor unworthy or unprepared? When we don't believe Christ's words or doubt them, since the words for you require all hearts to believe. And that talks about fasting and bodily preparation. That was in the box that, I, it was Jessica who read this box right up here. It talked about fasting and bodily preparation. What is fasting? And it doesn't mean running fast. What's fasting? When you're not eating. Okay, let's let Yosia talk. What we were saying, Yosia? Um, it means eating a little or nothing. Yep, what Faith and Yosia said. Daisy kind of echoed that, but yeah. yeah.
Yeah, they do some required fasting, and I think they're supposed to miss one meal a day or something like that, and then they put all the money into a, a can for what they would have spent for that meal, and they're supposed to donate it to church charities. I don't know how much of it goes to actually feed the poor and how much of it supports just general church operations, but they're required to do that. And even though, like, in our Christian churches, they recommend that you give 10%, Mormons absolutely must, and they know how, about how much you earn. They have a, and if you're not tithing or giving ten percent, they will have something to say to you. Yes, Vanessa, did you have a question? You're gonna have to unmute yourself if you want to ask. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, so fasting or denying yourself of food or other pleasures. It can be helpful for a period of time. A lot of times people give up something during Lent, right? Marie? Yes, ma'am. My sister keeps calling me ugly in the chat. Yeah, you're saying that I'm ugly. Miss Daisy, am I going to have to get your mom involved? Sibling rivalry here. Yeah, she's so mean. This is why. No. Just no. Did you hear that? She told you to shut up. <laughs> Goodness. I can share my screen and show you. Yeah, this is you'll see it, Daisy. Have your mom check on it. Uh oh. <laughs> so, yeah. Nobody here is ugly, right? She's like, mm. everybody but one person. So your preparation for Lord Self will be pondering what you have been saying to your sister and deciding whether there is anything to confess before you come to communion. <coughs> I often say when we talk about sinfulness at your age, yeah, if we just read this, the Ten Commandments at face value, we could all say check the blocks, but... At your at, at you guys' age, it's probably sibling rivalry and quarrels at school, and probably um, smarting off to parents or some of the things to confess before you come to communion, right? And when we start taking a look at those things as really being sinful, then we can't let ourselves off the hook, because we're all real tempted to want to read the Ten Commandments and and say, "I'm pretty good because this week I didn't murder anyone." And I didn't commit adultery this week, and you guys are all single, so you could definitely say you're not committing adultery, right? And um, I didn't steal. Well, maybe, and then we stopped to think, well, maybe I stole a few snacks out of the cabinet when mom told me not to. Fourth commandment, though, about obeying our parents, I probably snag everyone. But when we break it down to the ways we actually treat our friends and our siblings, that whole love your neighbor as yourself it's gonna hammer us it's gonna hammer us so it's important that we understand how the law actually applies to us so we don't go around saying i am too cool for school and then you wouldn't think you needed the lord's supper right because you'd say i don't sin but the point is we all do and we have to stop and think about how the law applies to us for me, another role I have as a mom, and I would love to be a perfect mom, but I make my mistakes, so I have to stop and ponder that, right? I'm teaching my 16-year-old son how to drive, and it's hard Daisy to... Daisy would not ever be a perfect mom. No, Daisy would be a bad mom. 
Oh, don't give Daisy a hard time. None of us is perfect, right? No, she's not. She makes people cry. Well, we all have some things, and I'm willing to stay on Daisy afterwards. Needs so bad, like she needs you here. Well, if if you guys want to, I can you know, stay on afterwards and chat with you guys. What's that? You broke it. You were jumping on your bed. Oh, now we're telling stories out of school. Well, I can stay on and chat with you guys afterwards if you want, but yeah. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I, I'm not here to judge, but I can imagine, you know, being in an adopted family is complicated. Because um, some people know that there are birth parents and some don't. And and your and Mr. and Mrs. Miller are lovely people, warm, loving people to, to have adopted you. But I'm sure it can be tempting every so often to let your mind wander off and think, yeah. Well, you'd be surprised which kids do and don't. You know, um, I know people think that, that that my son Jed must be a handful, but actually Jed is actually pretty obedient, even though he seems, yeah, you guys are laughing, but, um, but Jed and I had to establish a routine between us, and I, um, you know, we had to learn when stuff had to get done not to make it personal. And we hit that, that mark where it's like, and so Jed's actually pretty good about getting his chores done. We have our moments where sometimes I have to remind him. There's, there's certain other things that are a little harder for him. And I don't want to embarrass him by throwing him under the bus here because that would be a bad mom thing. Try not to throw my kids under the bus. But sometimes kids who who are really good kids for everyone else have stuffed so much inside that they explode for mom and dad. That's just a factor. So, so that becomes a challenge to, and, and I think we're, we may not finish Lord's Supper this week and that's okay because we need to get real here and deal with what's real. But you know, the, sometimes kids who are, look like real good kids for everyone spend so much of their effort stuffing it down inside themselves to where they can't stuff it anymore. And then come home and mom and dad and siblings get a harder time plus like I was saying about an adopted family I I don't know about that I'm not adopted but um, I did stay with another family a lot when I was a kid because my parents were were so quarrelsome and and everything but it can be easy to imagine that another family would be better I, I think in my case honestly my friends parents actually really were better but that's a whole other story but within an, an adoptive family, it's pretty typical for, for kids to have wishful thoughts like, if my biological mom and dad would have kept me, would it, would, would it have been easier? Would they have been nicer to me? Do my parents only do this because they adopted me? And, and stuff like that happens for real. If you're an adopted child and you feel those feelings, you're not the only one. It happens. And so those are things that you can talk to God about in prayer because maybe you don't think you can pray about those things like, oh my gosh, this is just so difficult and so weird. And, and it sounds so horrible to even talk to God about it. But, you know, you can talk to God about those things. And he's not going to kick you out of his presence because you have those feelings. Remember, Jesus had a stepfather himself. And, and I sent out Bible studies on Jesus' brothers and sisters and Jesus being a toddler and still not sinning. Can you imagine how Jesus' half-brothers and sisters felt? Gee, Jesus looks like mom's favorite all the time. She says his father is God. That sounds like favoritism to me. And look, Jesus is always a goody two-shoes. Never messes up. Never gets, you know, never gets in trouble because he's just... And maybe Joseph once in a while, even though he was there at the beginning of Jesus' life and knew that Jesus' father was God, maybe every so often Joseph felt resentful. 
Why am I raising this kid? He's not even, he's not even mine. And, and frankly, you know, yeah, I get it when my own kids say Jesus is annoying because it's a little annoying to have this, this perfect kid around. And sometimes I think Mary does favor him. All kinds of families in the Bible. Now, it doesn't say much about Jesus' family growing up, so we're just using our imagination. But Abraham and, and Ishmael and Isaac, when, when Abraham went and had a baby with Hagar, even though God had said he was going to have a baby with Sarah, they lost their faith. He had a baby with, with Hagar, and that created family chaos. And Esau and Jacob, the twins... And God had chosen Jacob, but Re um, Rebecca, his mother, said, I better help God along a little bit here. And she helped Jacob to trick Isaac, because Isaac favored Esau. Families are messy. They've been messy ever since Adam and Eve sinned. We talked about Cain and Abel earlier, Cain murdering Abel. First generation after the fall into sin, and a brother's murdering his brother. Messy stuff. And yet, out of mercy, God put a mark on Cain so nobody would come along and murder Cain. It doesn't say whether Cain actually confessed or whether he was just fearful and did what God said, but perhaps he confessed, and if he did, he was still forgiven. So, yeah. Those are things that are real, honest things from the heart that... That when we get ready to go to communion, and, and we're going to talk about being worthy. We'll save that for next next week. There's also a, um, some questions that Luther draws up in here, and, and we'll touch on those. Um, I think we're having a meeting next week. Or not next week, but next time we meet on the 3rd. Thank you. Um, but we'll talk about those because they're great preparation for going to the Lord's Supper. Um, Um, let me find those here. They're in your little paper one, too. Um, confession. It's called Christian Questions and Answers. And Luther couldn't cover everything. He did the best he could. There's a table of duties. We can review the table of duties. Yeah. Page 37, Christian Questions and Answers. And right before that, the table of duties to youth. To everyone, I mean, this gives us Bible verses that show, you know, what our duties are in this world. And I guarantee you, when we look at it, we're going to see we don't measure up. But question, or page 37, Christian, Christian questions and their answers. Great things to review before you go to communion. Talking about what page, is it? page 37. And we're going to take a look at those next week, or not next week, but next time we meet. Along with finishing up communion, we're going to take a look at these Christian questions and answers. But, you know, it's okay to stop and take a break from the teaching out of the book, because this is how we get real. I sometimes get cranky as a driver. I've told this story before, but I had to watch it. I was starting to call people idiots, and Jed was, Jed was starting to use the word idiot on people when he was about five, six years old, and I'm like, oops. I've obviously been throwing that idiot word around too much, and this has to stop. And he'll still call me on it. And when he does, he's actually right. I could get defensive, or I could listen to what he says and say, yeah, he's, he's, he's right, he's got a point there. Or sometimes he'll remind me I've been unfair as a mom, that I got cranky with him when he was doing his best. And now he's learning to drive, and, and I have to admit, I'm a little cranky and on edge, and I have to watch that I keep, keep my attitude right, because he's trying to learn. So yeah, we all sin, so you guys are on one side of it as youth. This is the table of duties on the pages before that. They, that starts on page, page 33, the tables of duties. It shows us how we should act but it's also going to guarantee you, show you the ways you sin. That's all kinds of things like um, hearers all their pastors. If we're not paying attention to or supporting our pastor, citizens, if you're in government, um, working for the government, or you have a, an elected position, husbands and wives and parents, parents and children, tells us parents not to exasperate our children. 
talks to children about workers. Okay. So I have like this cold sore on my tongue. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid for that to go away. Me it's too. like a pop pop. Um, it's like a pop pop. Oh, I've had those before. They feel awful. It's like really big because like I was picking at it. Oh, yuck. I used to get them on the side of my tongue. Where do you get yours? Where'd you get yours? Like sometimes on my side, but right now it's in like the front. Ooh. Does it hurt when you eat hot foods? Yeah, it's for constant. But um, it doesn't hurt when I eat, but it's just like I keep messing with it. Because it's like there. I've burnt the roof of my mouth and gotten slight blisters on there before too. Usually it's hot potatoes, like hot mashed potatoes or something that will get to me and, and burn the top of my mouth. So yeah, that's not fun. Which she as, wants me to tell you that she wants you to pray for her tooth because she's got spacers and she's going to give way to it on Tuesday. That's right. Wednesday. Because Pastor came over to chat with you and, and you guys are... Yeah. Now, when I got my braces, I didn't. I mine went a little bit differently. They they put the things on my teeth and then put the wires on all on the same day. But are you having spacers in between your teeth? Yeah. See, I didn't have to do that. Jed had some of that done. So I. I yeah. Wow. Well, I've heard that's pretty painful. You have to eat soft food for a while. Thanks for letting us know. Anybody else have prayer concerns? Yes, Miss Jessica. Well, for my mom. I was thinking about that. Maybe today, since we have so many prayer concerns, maybe I should start out with the prayers. And then when I finish up, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. I don't know how well we'll stay together on Zoom because there's a time lag, but we'll give it a try, all right? Okay, so we're going to close at a minute before, and we'll, we'll get into the last parts of the Lord's Supper, and we're going to look at some of those questions and, and take a quick glance at the table of duties, because that will show us what we need to confess to be ready for the Lord's Supper. All right. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth so many thousands of years ago as our Savior. Thank you for coming back time after time again in your Lord's Supper and help those who are preparing for their first Lord's Supper to be ready for it. We ask you to be with Daisy and her teeth to heal her, her mouth to take the pain away. We ask you to heal the cold sore in face mouth and we ask you to help keep her from getting so many in the future. We ask you to be with Maria Jessica and Vanessa's mom, as she deals with this collapsed lung, we ask you that the hospital treatment be safe and effective. We ask you here in America and around the world to, to take this COVID disease away soon to, to contain it, whether through some, some direct intervention of yours or through the vaccines that you're giving us, Lord Jesus. We ask you to keep the people in our families and our church safe. We ask you also to have faith and courage, knowing that whatever happens, you will take us home to be with you in heaven, whatever happens through this illness. We ask you to, to keep our minds and our hearts open to the Christmas story this year, to really think about how much it meant for Christ to come to earth as a baby and to stay on this earth and suffer and die for us. We ask you to be with us as we join together and say the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Very good. Anyone staying after with memory work today? All right. We'll finish up the... I'm sorry, go ahead. You're staying? Okay, very cool. Anybody else? Uh-huh.